Welcome to pre -read Shortcuts. My name is Marvin Munzo. I'm a pharmacy manager, superintendent of pharmacies, BBC featured media pharmacist, author of the book, Success Secrets for Students, personal trainer, international speaker, pre -read exam coach, mentor, founder of the pre -read Shortcuts, Community Pharmacy Managers of the Year Award, CND nominated for one of the top 50 most influential pharmacists, and I'm also a UK natural national bodybuilding champion. So in today's session, we're going to be focusing on chapter three of the BNF, and we're going to be using BNF 76. So today we're focusing on the respiratory system. So um, we're going to show you some tools. We're going to show you some information, essential information that can help you to succeed in your exam, um, the areas to highlight that the GPH is looking for for your exam, and just important points that are going to help you with your revision to make things so easy for you, make them so simple, and make them so digestible. So I'm very excited to be here today and to be doing this session with you. So what we're going to cover in this session, we're going to focus on drug delivery. We're going to look at inhaler devices, spacers, how to use them and how to care for them. Um, look into chronic asthma, stepwise management. We're also going to look at the different guidelines, the NICE guidelines, as well as the BTS stroke sign guidelines. We're going to look at acute asthma, how to manage acute asthma drugs used in asthma, COPD, and the management of COPD. We're also going to look at cystic fibrosis, croup, and mucolytics. So um, it's very interesting because this is one of those um, chapters that is a medium-weighted chapter. So um, not as much content like the previous chapters that we did, such as your cardiovascular. However, we do get questions for this in the exam. And generally, you need to also know about um, asthma because these are one of the most common, common um, conditions that you will come across in the pharmacy. So I'm very excited. Um, before we start, let me just talk to you about the GPHC recommendation about what to revise on this chapter. So I'm um, just some of the re recommendations. Obviously, these are not all exclusive, but um, these are some of the um, recommendations from the GPHC when you read this chapter. So these are the few things you need to focus on. Um, focus on the major diseases, so on asthma and COPD. You should also understand the current guidelines. When we talk about guidelines, I'm looking at your BTS guidelines. We'll look at your NICE guidelines on the management of asthma. And not only about the current guidelines, but you also need to know how to apply the guidelines to individual patients. We're also going to look at the mechanism of action. And that's what the GPH is recommending, that you need to understand the method of action for respiratory medicines, and also the rationale that is used um, with various combinations, um, such as your LABA with your ICS, which we shall get into later on. Um, also, patient-centered care, um, understand the factors that may cause non-adherence, such as inhaler type. Also, understand the side effects of respiratory medicines and be able to advise patients on recognizing these side effects as well as strategies to minimize the side effects. So these are all points that have been mentioned by the GPHC, and this is what you're gonna be tested on on this chapter. Also um, know what to monitor on asthmatic with asthmatic patients and how patients themselves, what actions they can take to help them to monitor and to manage their asthma. So that's what we're gonna be covering today using some of these tips from the GPHC to help you succeed, giving you the best information, the most up-to-date information so that you can produce those outstanding results that you desire and you deserve. So let's go into the next slide. Um, fine, chapter three, respiratory system. As I said earlier, we're going to be using, as we always do, BNF 76. All right, so come with me um, to page 235. So page 235 is your respiratory system, as you can all see. So um, if you look at the top, it says respiratory system drug delivery. So let's talk about the drug delivery. So it's important for your exam that you know about different types of drug deliveries. And um, the first one we're going to focus on is the inhalation route, which is one of the most common and most popular routes when it comes to asthma. So um, why do you use the inhalation routes? The advantages is because this route delivers medication directly to your airways. So that's one of the advantages of inhalation routes. They deliver medication directly to the airways. Also, you can administer smaller doses with your inhalation route, and that's normally very effective because then with smaller doses, you have less side effects. So these are the advantages of using the inhalation route. Um, we need to know the different types of um, inhaler devices, which you need to know, know for your exam and just generally. So you've got different types of inhaler devices. I'm going to focus on the three main ones or the most common ones that you will come across in practice. 
So your pressurized metered dose inhalers, what we call your PMDIs. Um, these are like your normal puffers that you get um, in the pharmacy that you use most of the time. And these are very common and normally easily to use by most patients. However, there are certain patients that find it difficult, such as children and elderly. The reason why they find it difficult is because they struggle with coordination. And um, as part of your exam, you need to know what to refer, what to recommend um, patients if they struggle to use an inhaler or a, a specific device. So in this case, um, you could recommend that patients that struggle with coordination or that struggle to use um, PMDIs can use spacer devices because the spacer, spacer devices remove the need for actuation and that can help the patient you also need to know that pmdis are very effective and they're very convenient for mild to moderate asthma and uh, we, we're going to go into different levels or levels of severity with asthma but um you just need to know that these are more effective um for mild to moderate asthma another important point when you're reading when you're studying you need to um know about your inhaler devices, but you also need to know what patients work best with certain inhaler devices. And you also need to know what to recommend if one device is not compatible with the patient. So the second one, we've got breath actuated inhalers. So examples are your auto inhalers. So these are normally suitable for adults and also for older children, provided they can use them effectively. And then finally, you have your dry powder inhalers such as your acuhalers, and these are quite useful for um, adults and also children above five years old, or um, adults or children that are unwilling or unable to use PMDIs. An important point, um, most patients um, could get switched from one device to another. And as part of your exam, and generally you need to know what the counsel patients that have switched device. Now, one of the common things that you get or one of the common symptoms or signs that you get from patients that come to the pharmacy is they may present to you a patient that has been changed a device from say a PMDI has been changed to a dry powder. For, for example, um, a patient that has been changed from, so Ventolin, um, PMDI has been changed from his Ventolin puffer to Ventolin acuhaler. When this happens for most patients, they notice a lack of sensation in the mouth and also in the throat, because normally with the PMDIs, they're used to having that sensation because of the actuation action. Now, when patients get changed from the PMDI to acu inhaler, most patients lose that sensation. And sometimes patients um, think that the medication isn't working or they cannot feel anything. So um, you need to advise patients that that switch from the PMDI to dry powder inhaler can cause this action. Um, coughing may also happen when you change patients from PMDIs to dry powder inhalers. Now let's look at the advice. Um, common advice, you need to know what advice to give patients that are actually on these inhalers. So the advice you need to instruct patients is on how to use the inhalers effectively. So you need to understand how to use each inhaler and also you need to check the inhaler technique. So poor technique is normally confused by most patients with lack of drug response. So um, you need to understand, know how to use it so I can advise patients on how to use the inhalers. Um, let's look at your spacer devices. Um, spacer devices are very common. And um, as far as the exam, you need to know how to use the spacer device. You also need to know how to care for your spacer device and what advice to give to patients when it comes to using spacers. So um, the main aim of spacer devices is to remove any need of coordination. So any patient that has challenged, as we mentioned earlier, with coordination using PMDIs, you can recommend spacers. And a big advantage or spacers is they allow you to have a very large proportion of particles inhaled and deposited in the lungs. So with spacers, you could get a larger volume of the drug, and that's one of the advantages, and that's going to be deposited in the lungs. So that's quite a good advantage of using spacers. And spacers tend to be very useful. You need to know what patients will, uh, will use spacers. They're very useful for patients that have a poor inhalation technique, um, children, patients that need high doses of inhaled corticosteroids, um, patients for nocturnal asthma, patients that are prone to candidiasis with inhaled corticosteroids. So these are the patients that um, spacer devices will be useful for, and these are the patients that you want to recommend spacer, um, spacer devices to. Another important point is um, the size of the spacer device does matter. And normally larger spacer devices with just one 
wave valves are normally most the most effective um, space of devices that you can recommend. So um, an example is your volumatic that you see in the pharmacy. The volumatic is a very good example of a spacer that is quite large and that has a um, one wave valve. And these are those that are the most effective. Um, also, um, your inhalers, need to, um, the device um, is not always compatible with different ones. So basically, certain spacer devices are compatible with certain meter dose inhalers. All right. And um, your spacer devices are not interchangeable. So you cannot switch between spacer devices. And you need to make sure that the right spacer device is recommended for the right meter dose inhaler. Um, in terms of the use and the care of your spacer, um, spacer devices, you need to know how to use them, what advice to give to the patient, how to look after the spacer devices. Okay. So um, this is the advice that um, you need to know. Um, to, you need to inhale or the patients need to inhale from the spacer as soon as possible. The reason is because um, the drug aerosol is very short lived. So once um, they spray the, in, the aerosol into the um, chamber or into the spacer, they need to inhale this as soon as possible. Also, a single dose actuation is normally recommended. So they could just do that, um, inhale it. Just a single dose is normally recommended because that's fine. However, certain patients still prefer to have the tidal breathing, which is still equally as effective as a single breath. Um, in terms of cleaning the um, device, you need to advise patients to clean the device, but they should normally clean this device just once a month. There are certain manufacturers that will recommend more than once a month, but the general advice is to recommend them to clean it once a month. And one of the reasons is because you want to prevent that electrostatic um, action that it could have. So the electrostatic um, particles could affect drug delivery. Okay. Um, in terms of cleaning um, the spacers, you need to be able to advise patients to clean these inhalers with mild detergents or to clean these devices, these spacers with mild detergents, but they need to allow them to dry in air, okay? Do not rinse them, do not dry them yourself. Advise the patients to just clean them in mild detergent and allow them to air dry. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you need to avoid cleaning the inhaler more than once a month. And the reason is because the electrostatic charge can affect drug delivery. And uh, another common um, point which most um, patients are not aware of, most um, pharmacists feel to advise patients, is patients need to replace the in um the spacers every six to 12 months okay so the, the spacers need to be replaced every six to 12 months now let's look at um different um drug deliveries um you have nebulizers and nebulizers are used normally for very severe acute asthma. So we're looking at, uh, I said, we're gonna look at the different severities of asthma, but with severe acute asthma, that's when you normally use nebulizers. And they're normally driven um, by, by oxygen in a hospital. So you normally come across most nebulizers that was recommended to be given in hospital settings as opposed to um, in the community or in a home setting. So um, you need to also know how nebulizers work. So they mainly um, convert solutions of a drug into an aerosol for inhalation. So they basically just convert the solution into this aerosol, makes it easy for you to inhale. Okay, and one of the big, big advantages of nebulizers is with nebulizers, you can give very high doses of the drug. Hence one of the reasons why they're normally used for very severe asthma. Um, the next one, um, let's look at oral. That's another route. It's um, your oral route, which is used normally for most patients that cannot use their inhaled route uh, for any reason. Um, downside, um, say for instance, your tablets, I'll give an example. So your prednisolone tablets, for instance. Um, the downside with, um, oral, with the oral route is that you get more systemic side effects compared to inhalation. So that's a potential advice uh, you need to give the patients that with um, tablets, with the oral road, there's a higher chance of having systemic side effects compared to inhalers or inhalation. Um, examples, you need to know some of the examples of some of the oral drugs that use in asthma, such as your beta-2 agonists, corticosteroids, theophylline, and your leukotriene receptor antagonist. Um, so let's look at chronic asthma. So as you know, um, asthma is obviously a disease of your airways, it's an obstructive disease of the airways. And asthma is very common and it's a chronic inflammation condition of the airways. Okay, so it's a chronic inflammation condition of your airways. 
what you need to absolutely know and what a GPSC recommends, and you should be able to identify the symptoms of a patient that presents with asthma. So what are the common symptoms for asthma? You're looking at a cough, wheezing, chest tightness, breathlessness. And what you need to also um, know is that symptoms vary in, term, in terms of different symptoms vary in severity okay so sometimes the symptoms could be very severe and other times they might be mild right so sometimes you can have the symptoms that are so bad that that can provoke an asthma attack and that could lead to hospitalization so you've got these different symptoms but in terms of severity they're all different and sometimes some of the symptoms say for instance the chest tightness could be so severe that that can trigger some an asthma attack and that could lead to hospitalization all right um we need to know about the aims of treatments with asthma. So what are the aims of treatment? So the main aim of treatment is to control the asthma. And when we talk about controlling asthma, we're looking at certain things. So what is a good control? So good control means you have no daytime symptoms. So your patients will have no daytime symptoms, no nighttime awakening. So they wouldn't wake up at night due to asthma, no asthma attacks, no need for rescue medication, no limitations on activity. So for, um, we talk about exercise and use asthma. So um, any patient that's got asthma, you want to make sure that they're able to go out and exercise without experiencing those symptoms, which you meant, mentioned earlier, and also to um, sort of restore some sort of normal lung function. So these are the, these, these are the sort of the, the tick boxes that um, tell you or that you can use as an, an indicator to tell if asthma is well controlled. Um, so the number of reasons why um, you can have uncontrolled asthma, I just put a few down for you. So lack of adherence, so not using it according to directions, um, suboptimal inhaler technique, hence the reason why it's so important that you that you know the inhaler techniques so you counsel your patients. It's actually recommended or advised that you need to frequently go through patients with review review patients on the inhaler techniques but also if they're going to put them on a new inhaler or if they're starting any new inhaler or using a different inhaler make sure that you counsel them on inhaler techniques um, other reasons of uncontrolled asthma smoking and this could be active smoking or passive smoking and they've got your seasonal and environmental factors that could um make your asthma uncontrolled or that could affect your asthma all right, so um, other, uh, another advice um, that you need to give patients on asthma is there are certain things that can help to improve asthma, and these are certain lifestyle changes. So for instance, weight loss. So advising patients on different ways in which they can lose weight can help to improve some of the symptoms. Also um, offer smoking cessation. So any sort of smoking cessation advice or any programs that are there for the patients, make sure that you recommend that to them for anyone who smokes, because that will help to improve the asthma. And also um, there's also a lot of breathing exercise programs that you could recommend patients attend because most of these breathing exercise programs have been shown to improve the respiratory rate and they've improved asthma. Um, I've just put this down for general advice. So one of the general advice is just um, in terms of um, dealing with asthma and the management of asthma is um, after starting, anytime a new patient is started on an, on an asthma medication or, just, or if the medication is just being reviewed as opposed to a new medication, um, you need to review them after four to eight weeks. So generally wait for four to eight weeks anytime you've started a patient on a new inhaler or if you just changed the inhaler or you've adjusted a dose, then you need to wait four to eight weeks as a time frame to then review them. Okay. And the whole aim is to adjust, especially your ICS, which is your corticosteroids, your inhale corticosteroids, your maintenance therapy. Um, with these, um, with the maintenance therapy, the main aim is that you want to look at the lowest dose as possible to maintain the most effective control. So the aim, especially with the steroids, um, is to make sure that we use the lowest dose to get the maximum or the most effective control. Um, you need to also ensure that patients can use the devices, what we've said before, at the reviews, you need to make sure they can use those device. And also when a new device is given or supplied, make sure that they, before they leave, they know exactly how to use the device. 
Okay, so let's move moving on to the management, which is um, the most popular one, right? That's what you probably get in your exams as well. Is the management of asthma? Now, this is um, I'm going to go into this later on in more detail. However, with um, the management is quite confusing because you've got two guidelines. You've got the Nice guidelines. You've got the BTS guidelines, which um, are quite similar, but at the same time, they've got a few differences that is very confusing. And many many students ask me, which do I study? Do I do the Nice guidelines or the BTS? My advice is you need to learn both because that's what the GPHC recommends. Um, so um, we use what we call the stepwise approach in the management of asthma. And the main aim of the stepwise approach is to stop the symptoms quickly and also to improve peak flow. All right, so before initiating a new drug or before adjusting treatment, so if you're going to give a new drug or you're going to adjust treatment, before you do that, you need to first check that the diagnosis is correct. Number two, check for the patient's adherence before you use a new drug to make sure it's been optimized. Um, check the inhalation technique and then eliminate any trigger factors for acute asthma. So once you've done all of this, then you can go on then to initiate a new, um, new medication or to adjust a dose. Um, another thing that's important um, is offering a personalized action plan. So um, all patients need to have an act, a personalized action plan, which are just asthma plans that give them more information on how to manage the asthma, on how to identify um, signs of um, asthma. So you give them more information, you educate the patient. So every patient needs to have an action, a personalized action plan, giving them all the information, what to look out for and how to manage the asthma. And also this, this plan could be given to the family members and to carers. Um, you need to also know the difference, as I mentioned, between BTS and SIGN and also NICE, right? And um, the recommendations in the BNF. So in your BNF 76, um, most of the guidelines that we use and what we're going to use here is the NICE guidelines. At the same time, um, there's a lot of um, the BTS guidelines is probably the most common and probably the most practical and probably has more, more benefits um, than the NICE guidelines. And um, But later on, I'm going to show you, give you a slide or a link that can help you to see the difference between um, the BTS and the NICE guidelines. But we're gonna to touch on a few of them. So let's look into the uh, management of chronic asthma, the stepwise approach. So if you go with me to page 236 to 239, so 236 to 239, I've highlighted some parts here, and this, this parts are highlighted in black. Normally show you the difference um, between the NICE guidelines and the BTS. So you need to learn. I wouldn't say go into so much detail about difference, but just be aware of these that are highlighted in your BNF because they show you the difference between BTS and your NICE guidelines in the management of asthma. So I'm going to use the NICE guidelines for this um, session, and I'll also highlight a few things that are BTS. So let's look into management of adults for greater than 17 years old, so 17 years old and above. Um, you normally start with step one, and step one is your mild intermittent asthma. So patients that have got mild intermittent asthma, this is when you use the reliever. And, it's, and with step one, we normally use a short-acting beta to agonist, what we call a SABA, for example, your salbutamol or terbutalin. Right, so I'll try to put some pictures that I can help you. But yeah, so step one is using a short-acting beta to agonist, SABA. And... Um, before you move to step two, um, certain things need to happen. If any of these conditions happen, or if you experience any of these, or a patient experiences any of these, then that's a trigger to move on to step two. So um, you move on to step two, if um, having given the short acting beta to agonist, the patient is experiencing asthma symptoms three times or more a week. If they're waking up at night, or if they wake up at night due to asthma symptoms, if asthma is still uncontrolled, despite giving them the SABA alone, then um, number four, which is from the BTS, I've tried to um, highlight that in blue because that's from BTS. So it's other ones are from NICE guidelines, but it's from the BTS. If they've had an exacerbation in the last two years, then you need to move them onto step number two. And step number two is where we give them, it's called the preventer or maintenance therapy stage. So this is when we normally use a low dose inhaled corticosteroid. All right, so use a low dose inhaled corticosteroid. And um, I've just highlighted there, in terms of low dose, what is low dose is different. So the BTS guidelines has a different um, definition for low dose and NICE has a different one. But um, I've just written the NICE guidelines. So NICE guidelines, when we talk about low dose of ICS, we're talking about less than or equals to 400 micrograms of budesonide or equivalent. 
So you've got a different equivalent, especially if you deal with beclomethazone. Bec but this is when we talk about low dose, we're looking at less than or equals to 400 micrograms. If um, you've given the patient the low dose of ICS and that has not helped to relieve um, the symptoms, then you can move on to step number three, which is what we call add-on therapy. Step number three is to then add a leukotriene receptor antagonist, what we call your LTRA. So um, that's step number three, you add an LTRA. Very important, very important. Now, this is the big difference between the NICE guidelines and the BTS. The big change has happened is normally with the BTS, and which has been for many years, um, in this stage, after the ICS, you add a LABA, so a long-acting beta agonist. That's normally what the protocol is. But um, with the NICE guidelines, um, the changes happen is that this LABA has been replaced by LTRA. So with the new NICE guidelines, after ICS in your add-on therapy, after your ICS, the next thing you add on is LTRA rather than a LABA. So that's an important difference that you need to know. And um, if you add the LTRA, you need to review that patient in four to eight weeks, okay? So add the, as I mentioned earlier, you add the LTRA, you review the patient in four to eight weeks, and if that's still not improved, you're still not getting the relief, then you could add the LABA. So you could add the long-acting beta-2 agonist. So it's important you know the difference at this stage between where you add the LABA for the BTS and where you add the LABA for NICE. Very important, that could potentially come up in your exam. Um, so if you add the LABA, you could either stop the LTRA or not, or you could continue the patient on the LTRA if, it's, if necessary. But if that still doesn't give any relief, then you change the ICS and the LABA to what we call the MART regimen. The MART regimen is simply an ICS and a fast-acting, long-acting beta agonist, such as formoterol, so um, with um, a low dose of ICS. So if I said, if um, you add the long acting beta to agonist, the LABA, and that's not giving the relief, um, then you can move on to change the ICS and the LABA to a MAT regime, okay? If that's still not working with the MAT regime, then you can increase the dose of the ICS from a low dose to a moderate dose. So what do you mean by moderate? It's important you know the difference between low dose, moderate dose, and high dose, okay? So if the low dose isn't working, then you increase the mod to the moderate dose, which is anything above 400 micrograms to 800 micrograms budesonide or equivalent. Now, and I can get you some of the beclomethazone equivalents, okay? So that's moderate. So between 400 to 800, right? Continue with the MAT or you could, if you could either continue the MAT or you can change to a fixed dose of ICS and LABA and SABA. Mm. If that's still not giving any relief, then you increase the dose further from moderate ICS to high ICS, which is anything above 800 micrograms of budesonide or equivalent, right? And if that still doesn't help, then you could add a long-acting muscarinic receptor antagonist, what we we'll call a LAMA, or you could give them to add some theophylline, or you recommend that patient to specialist advice. So you can recommend them to go for specialist healthcare advice. So these are the steps for the NICE guidelines when managing asthma, chronic asthma with patients that are above 17 years old. So quite a few steps there, but it's just about reading them and just memorizing them. Okay, so it looks like a lot of information, but it's quite easy once you've gone through them. Um, so now we're going to look at children less than five years old. So you need to know um, with NICE guidelines, you're looking at the adults at, at, um, plus or equals to 17 years old. And that's another difference with BTS as well. I think BTS looks at, uses adults as 12 years old. So that's another difference. So um, let's look at the children less than five years old. So um, the same sort of principle, you start off with a SABA, a short acting beta agonist, and then if that doesn't relieve, then you do an eight week trial of the pediatric moderate dose of an ICS. Okay, eight weeks trial of pediatric moderate dose of an ICS. And then after eight weeks, you stop the ICS. And then you continue to monitor the child's symptoms. 
So give them the um, ICS, the moderate ICS for eight weeks, and then stop and then monitor the symptoms. Now, if you monitor a child's symptoms and it's not resolved and the symptoms do not resolve during the eight week period, right? Then you have to review whether there's an alternative diagnosis, right? Now, if symptoms did resolve, however, they reoccurred we, we within four weeks of stopping the ICS treatment, then you need to restart this patient on an ICS at a pediatric low dose. Now, if symptoms resolved, but they only reoccurred beyond four weeks after stopping the ICS treatment, then you need to repeat the eight-week trial of the pediatric moderate dose ICS. So um, those are the points you need to look at. That's um, how asthma using the NICE guidelines. The NICE guidelines, in my opinion, sounds or comes across as more complex than the BTS, but um, you need to learn both. Um, children that are less than five years old, if uncontrolled on pediatric low dose of ICS, so that's a continuation, then you can add an RTRA in addition to the ICS. And if that still doesn't work on low dose ICS and LTRA, then you can stop the LTRA and refer to a healthcare professional for investigation. So that, that's your asthma. Um, the next one is management. So we've looked at um, the NICE um, for adults that are above or equal 17 years old. We've looked at children that are less than five years old. And now we need to look at the management for children that are between five to 16 years old. So you need to know all of them. So step one, again, SABA. Um, step two is your pediatric low dose of ICS, normally less than 200 micrograms, um, budesonide equivalent. If that doesn't work, then you move on to step three, which is you add your LTRA and you review the treatment after four to eight weeks. If that doesn't work, you stop your LTRA and then you start the LABA in combination with your ICS. Okay, so you could change the ICS and the LABA to a MART regime, just like we mentioned about the adult dose with pediatric low dose ICS. If that still doesn't work, then you increase your ICS to moderate. So you move it from this low dose ICS, then you increase it to moderate ICS. So that's anything greater than 200 micrograms to 400 micrograms budesonide or equivalent. So you, and then you either continue with your MART or you change to a fixed dose of ICS plus LABA plus SABA. If that still doesn't work, then you I could either seek professional advice or you could at this stage consider increasing the moderate ICS to high dose ICS, which is anything above 400 micrograms per day, so nice or equivalent, or you could add an, a drug such as theophylline. So these are the different ways you manage chronic asthma in um, adults, in children. So it's important that you learn them, that you know about at what stage each drug is added, and you also know about the dose and the definitions of low dose, high dose, and moderate dose. So um, I'm going to go to the next one. So what I put on here, say so you need to know the difference. So this is um, the um, adult um, guideline for your BTS. So it's a different plan with the BTS, quite similar, but I just want to point out um, here, you could see with the BTS is recommended at step number one, they use an ICS. So recommended ICS because in the past, many um, children um, or individuals passed away um, because and one of the reasons is because they were on the SABA. And so this is justified um, with the BTS. The first step is at that stage, you can use a low dose ICS. And if you come over here to the add-on therapy, you can see right there that the first add-on therapy is the LABA compared to the NICE, which will, the first add-on therapy now after your ICS is your LTRA with the BTS is the LABA. So, um, that's it for now. There's still a lot of things. This is also um, still the BTS for um, control management of asthma in children. So the first one we showed, the green one, is management of asthma in adults. And then this is management of asthma in children. Um, I have a link here for you. So with this link, it shows you, it's a very good link that shows you the difference between the NICE and BTS guidelines. So it's very good. You want to go into that link. It's um, by the thorax um, bmj.com, which I found, and that really gives you the difference. It makes a very good comparison between your NICE and your BTS guidelines. So um, 
I still have, this is still part of it. There's still a lot more we can go through, but now that's already half an hour. So um, we're gonna end it here. There's more, we have more of this on our lecture course. So to get a full slide, you have exercise induced asthma, pregnancy, acute asthma, management of asthma, bronchodilators, long acting beta, to, beta agonists, parenteral, anti-muscarinic bronchial um, dilators, Theophilines, these are all um, things that the GPC recommends that you need to study. You need to know about the side effects of all these drugs and how they act. Um, COPD, the management of COPD, everything you need to know about COPD, croups, um, we've got asthma, the use of um, corticosteroids and asthma. So there's still a lot, a lot of information, a lot of slides, antihistamines, but all of these focus on exactly the main things you need to know in this chapter. So um, thank you for watching. If you have any questions, please just ask them at the bottom. Go through those guidelines. The guidelines will get a bit complex, but once you go through the guidelines a few times, you can get your head easily around them. Um, if you look at the bottom, somewhere in this video, I'm gonna put a link for our course. So if you wanna get all the slides and you wanna get more information and you wanna elaborate more into most of the things that you've seen today, then you wanna enroll onto our clinical course or into our combo course, pre-reg course, which starts um, next month, the 7th of February. And in that course, we cover the entire BNF, every single chapter in a lot of detail and show you the key things you need to learn for your exam. So until I see again, stay positive. You can pass the exam, you will pass the exam and use this knowledge to become an excellent pharmacist to make a tremendous contribution and difference to society. Believe in you, stay positive and all the best in your exams. Bye.